Good morning. Let's see if we're on here. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, this morning's meeting is um, looking at transportation, energy, and uh, climate policy, or the intersection of all of these things. Um, in some ways, this is, um, I don't know that I would have foreseen having this meeting uh, when I first started doing energy policy four years ago or so. Um, at that time, it seemed like uh, once oil prices got up above 350 a gallon, why we'd have a tremendous surge of popular interest in changing our energy policies, and that would um, kind of deal with some of the climate problems if we hadn't reached agreement on a climate bill already. So here we sit. It's 2011. Um, last month, we spent 42, American drivers spent $42 billion on gasoline. Uh, which was about 11 billion more than they spent the previous March and possibly 20 billion more than we spent the March before that. So we've got this sort of, um, we, we've got a, a, a pressing uh, gasoline and oil issue um, a, as well as sort of a, a hemorrhage of money from the econo economy and from uh, individual household budgets on this issue. And um, we don't have agreement on a climate bill. Uh, in fact, uh, just yesterday, I guess the Senate uh, decided against taking away the EPA's right to regulate greenhouse gases. So we're doing a lot of this stuff through the back door. Um, and, and we've also got an upcoming transportation bill coming. And I think one of the trends in policy as this gets stickier, um, addressing these issues gets stickier, is that we, we look for synergies. And so now we've got all of these three issues are, are kind of stacking up together in transportation bills. And today I think we're going to talk about pushing those synergies even further. Um, why do synergies make sense? The, the title of this event is Uncommon Wisdom. And um, I think one of the things about the, the, the synergies between these policy issues is that they actually make kind of intuitive sense to people who use the transit or who have to get around. Um, over the last couple of months, I've been working on a project called Energy Trap, which the website is energytrap.org, should you desire to go there. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing is looking at how much families or households are spending on their commutes. And we found, uh, I found a guy in Maine who's working an entire extra job so that he and his wife can afford the cars and the fuel and the insurance to drive to their other two jobs. Um, this is just an extraordinary burden. Um, and and it's something that is really affecting households. It affects, in a sense, you know, one of the, we don't think of energy as something that affects income inequality or, um, or sort of local economic vitality, but it certainly is because of the amount of money that it takes and the amount of resources it requires. So intuitively, this makes a lot of sense to people. Now, one of the, one of the kind of issues that uh, when gas prices are high like this, you look for chances for people to take other ways to get to work. And um, in thinking about this uh, last week, I was out at a, I was in, in California, which is where I'm based, and I was in a city called um, San Ramon, which um, isn't actually very much of a city. It's a, it's a sort of an exurb in California. It's where Chevron's headquarters are. Um, and it's at a, um, uh, it, there's an office park there called Bishop Ranch that's about 30 years old. What's interesting about Bishop Ranch is that it has 30,000 people working at it for 500 different companies, and 33% of them leave their cars at home. That's a really big percentage. The national percentage for people taking uh, public transportation is 4.7%. Uh, people can correct me. Uh, the panel may know better. Um, and uh, carpools are maybe 10%. This is a, approximately double that. And uh, it takes a lot of work. There's one lady named Marcy who basically corrals people from the moment they, they get employment there and begins um, kind of hurting them towards leaving their car at home. So I was talking to Marcy about how you get 10,000 people out of their cars. <laughs> and um, 
And uh, what she said was, well, you know, nobody does it because of uh, their in environmental beliefs specifically, and nobody does it specifically because they need a new way to work. Actually, what happens is people have to have a bunch of different reasons, and then the reasons that she started to list were kind of extraordinary, one of them being exercise, in that she suggests to people that they get off uh, their public transit stops two stops early and walk, and that way they save time on the treadmill. And um, there are also people who save about, there's at least one person uh, who saves $10,000 a year because they're taking the public transit rather than commuting by car. Um, but other people spend time not fuming in traffic. And over two or three weeks of kind of experimentally taking public transit or, or, or some other transit arrangement like a carpool, um, they realize that their stress level has dropped. Now, if you talk to policy people, they'll say what we need is more light rail. Um, they won't say we need a way for people to, uh, to spend less time on the treadmill and more time walking to their job. <laughs> Um, and this is the way that these sort of the synergies in in Marcy's presentation of how to get more people out of their cars um, make intuitive sense to people on the ground, but to policymakers they're a little bit of a new thing. So what we're going to talk about today is is where we are in um, transit energy and um, transit energy and climate policy, and then we're going to talk about some is some interesting synergies that have kind of come up. Um, both in the policy sphere and on the ground. Uh, we have a wonderful panel today. Um, we have uh, Jed Kolko, who's an analyst with the Public Policy Institute of California. He's done um, years of very highly detailed analysis on California economic growth and um, the relationship between policies and economic growth in California um, at, at a, an incredibly granular level that's uh, kind of exciting to read his reports. I really recommend that you pick up the report out there and then uh, go to the website and get more reports, because everyone needs more reports. Um, and we also have <laughs> Darren Lovas from, uh, from NRDC. He's the director of their Transportation Policy Initiative. He's spent many years in the trenches of energy and transportation policy. And uh, at the end, we have uh, Shinpei Tsai, who's from the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And she's working on a new initiative there uh, you're the director of the new initiative there, and I'm, I'm just going to make sure I get the title right. It's the Leadership Initiative on Transportation Solvency. Uh, Shinpei also has spent um, years working uh, on the ground on, on transportation and, um, and development uh, design, and I believe you're a LEED certified architect as well? I'm an architect, I'm LEED certified. Okay, she's LEED certified. Um, okay, so with that, what I'd like to do is, is um, kick off with Darren. Uh, who is himself a great synergist amongst policy areas, and uh, give us a little sense of where we are in um, transit energy and climate policy at the moment, and um, and what's at stake. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm Darren with NRDC, and it's good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, and we're, we're kind of a, we're at an exciting time. Uh, and an anxious time <laughs> when it comes to energy and transportation policy, especially at the, the federal level uh, here in here in D.C. Uh, um, uh, and I'm hoping on this panel we can talk about where we are with, with uh, energy and transportation policy and the potential linkages, uh, um, some uh, financial sustainability issues, which I know that uh, both Jed and Shinpei especially uh, work on, and that's crucial for the transportation uh, program especially, and then get into some innovative practices. So to start to, to set the stage, as, as Lisa asked, um, uh, on energy first, um, uh, uh, in 2005, uh, Congress passed an energy bill uh, that was mostly focused on increasing production, although it did have some uh, noteworthy energy efficiency provisions in it. In 2007, Congress passed another energy bill. Uh, um, uh, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, which contained a lot of historic efficiency provisions, including the first uh, increase in decades uh, in fuel economy standards for light duty vehicles and the first ever uh, mandate to uh, um, uh, apply fuel economy standards for heavy and medium duty vehicles as well in terms of surface transportation. And there were other policies that were focused on uh, efficiency, uh, uh, fuel efficiency in the transportation sector. And then, of course, in 2009 and 2010, we debated uh, yet another uh, energy bill, this time focused more on climate, 
uh, and that those negotiations collapsed. And right now, uh, um, uh, and this shouldn't be surprising with uh, gas prices up at uh, $4 a gallon in a, a lot of pumps across the country, again, um, uh, Congress and the administration are once again uh, edging towards uh, enacting more energy policy. Uh, yesterday there were three uh, House bills uh, uh, rolled out uh, by Doc Hastings of the Natural Resources Committee, all focused on increased production, including the first ever production increase target I've seen in, in a bill. Um, and you're going to see, I, I assume, a lot more markers come out of the woodwork uh, in Congress. And uh, the President spoke at Gamesa yesterday, and he's given several speeches on energy over the past couple weeks, showing just what a concern this is for Americans and the fact that a lot of people are once again pivoting to, to energy policy. Um, on the transportation side, uh, um, uh, we, we are again uh, uh, debating in a sus sustained, prolonged uh, um, way uh, a, a, a new transportation policy for the nation. And the last one, we, the last bill we passed at the federal level was in 2005, even though the previous law expired in 2003. So it took almost two years and about a dozen extensions to finally get a new bill. And that was uh, in, in uh, fat times in terms of revenue to the program. Now we're in lean times, and uh, we have a real problem. Since 2008, uh, $35 billion have been transferred uh, to the general fund from the general fund to the highway trust fund to keep it solvent. And this is what Shin Pei's effort is focused on resolving especially. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, from her about that. And it underscores the fact that the current transportation program is contributing actively to our deficit and debt. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, one of the ways to get around that is, of course, to increase the gas tax, uh, the federal gas tax, which hasn't been increased since 1993. Um, and uh, I believe it needs to be increased. However, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a very difficult issue to tackle. Uh, and you can see that when you look at the, the President's Fiscal Commission's uh, recommendations, which included a 15 cent a gallon gas tax increase to be phased in. Uh, um, and then uh, 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 Pew did a poll uh, of the various recommendations in the Fiscal Commission's uh, report. And right at the bottom, in terms of popularity, was the gas tax increase. So there's a real challenge in terms of uh, uh, how revenue starved this program is uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, how, to, how to remedy that, uh, while at the same time cutting waste within the program. So, and, and actually, the, 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 the most recent development that I've seen that underscores a contrast between visions that uh, uh, here in Washington about the program is um, uh, the administration has, its, uh, has a very big uh, vision for uh, uh, 2012 and beyond in terms of expansion of the program. Uh, and as you all know, Congressman Ryan yesterday unveiled his proposal for the 2012, uh, fiscal 2012 budget. Uh, and it's th the transportation program stands out as the biggest cut compared to uh, President Obama's proposed budget. Uh, it's a cut of, of about 56 percent, right, uh, uh, which is higher than any other category of cut. The only thing that comes close is a cut to uh, uh, international aid at about 50 percent. So um, there's a real clash of, of, uh, of visions unfolding here, and, and it's, it's, it's making it very difficult to move forward with, uh, with uh, transportation, uh, federal transportation policy. Um, so that, that's where we're at. We're, we're headed, it seems, towards more energy policy. And meanwhile, uh, we're sort of uh, muddling through in terms of transportation policy, and the Obama administration has a proposal. Uh, Transportation Chairman Micah in the House is working on a proposal with his staff, and uh, um, uh, Environment and Public Works Committee Chairman Boxer is working on a proposal uh, with her staff. So, um, uh, and everyone has said we're going to do a six-year bill, and we're we're going to get it done by the August recess. So, the next few months, uh, um, uh, we'll be able to see whether or not that actually transpires. Uh, um, uh, so. This is why it's an exciting time for both energy policy and transportation policy, and it's also an anxious time. A lot of people are, are, are waiting to see what happens in both these policy spaces. Um, one, thing, one thing I want to talk about that, uh, uh, very briefly that uh, um, uh, makes the energy challenge a, a little more difficult um, uh, is, uh, I think, pretty clear evidence that uh, um, um, 
no matter how much we increase domestic production, um, we're, we're going to have a hard time uh, moving the needle on prices at the pump. Um, uh, and the nearest evidence at hand about that uh, is, is Canada. Others point to the United Kingdom. That's another good example. But Canada is even more uh, um, uh, uh, salient, I think. Uh, Canada uh, uh, produces 3.3 million barrels a day. And thanks to uh, uh, exploitation of the tar sands in Alberta, uh, their reserves, uh, proved reserves, are about nine times ours. So they have a massive level of reserves. And to, coupled with the 3.3 million barrel a day production figure is a 2.2 million barrel a day consumption figure. So they are a big net exporter of oil, and that's only going to increase over time. If you sit down at your computer and you Google, uh, uh, Canada and gas prices, you will see, though, that consumers there are as angry about prices at the pump as they are here. And then all you have to do is track what happens with gas prices in Canada versus here to see that they track a global uh, uh, oil, crude oil price. Uh, the, the, there's a huge global marketplace, 86 million barrels a day consumed globally, uh, and it's dragging prices up and down no matter whether you're uh, a, a net exporter or not. So Canada shows uh, um, uh, just how futile it is to hang our hat solely on or even to start with increased production here. Um, the UK is another example. Uh, they've only recently become a, a net importer uh, because the, the North Sea uh, uh, supply is dwindling. Uh, but um, uh, they still uh, produce pretty close to what they consume, and yet they too uh, have faced uh, um, uh, a, a lot of uh, discontent about prices at the pump and, uh, pump, and as recently as 2008, there were trucker riots and demonstrations about uh, the increases in diesel prices in the UK, in spite of the fact that they produce almost m as much oil as they consume. So there's, there's sort of a, a sobering reality about oil that uh, uh, policymakers here have yet to come to terms with, let alone explain it to the public. Um, and it underscores uh, just just how massive our energy challenge is when we have uh, uh, when we consume 19 million barrels of, of oil a day, produce uh, a little less than half that much, uh, and therefore uh, um, uh, we really need to develop substitutes and to use this resource more efficiently. And the question is, how can policy make that happen? Um, so that's not to end on a dark note, but this is there. There's really. There's a hard reality about energy that I don't think policymakers are facing up to. Uh, even the president, I don't think, is facing up to it. Uh, and it, it's something we need to, to tackle. Uh, I have a quick question about that. Given, the, um, given that the, um, our chances of drilling our way out of this problem are, are limited, it seems that that pushes the relevant policy really into the realm of transportation policy and other behavior changing policies and, and uh, efficient, in, in a sense, industrial policy when you look at energy efficiency for the cars. Um, so I wonder if you could, is, is there a relevant sort of push towards this more domestic focused, um, use focused policy? And is that how we should interpret President Obama's target of reducing? I think he was reducing oil, con reducing foreign imports by 3 million barrels a day. Yeah, and I, I wish the president had chose a different metric, frankly, because, uh, I mean, ultimately, I mean, we really effic how efficiently we use this resource and whether or not there are substitutes that compete with it uh, within a transportation sector that's 95 percent dependent on it um, uh, are key questions for making sure Americans pay, pay less. Um, uh, the answer to your question is that, yes, there's, there's an opportunity. Uh, as long as Congress uh, um, and their constituents are, are you know, f uh, face up to it and uh, um, uh, put new policy in place, and as long as the administration uses some of the tools that they, a they actually have at their disposal currently, thanks to current law, um, uh, as aggressively as possible. And, and the, the, of course, the, the biggest question uh, uh, for us is how high will the administration set the bar in terms of required fuel economy for new light-duty vehicles um, uh, through model year 2025. And they're working on a rule uh, um, regarding that right now. And the range that EPA and DOT uh, have determined is feasible is uh, uh, 47 miles per gallon to 62 miles per gallon. 
right? So that's what's technically achievable by 2025 for new vehicles. The question is where in that range they'll end up. And theoretically, what's happening uh, with concerns over gas prices and how much Americans pay for gas, uh, um, uh, there should be pressure to raise that bar. And I think, I think the administration is feeling it, and the question is over the next few months, how far will they raise it? So there is a performance standard at play. Um, in terms of other, other policy, uh, um, uh, um, I mean, that's, I think that's more up to, to Congress and uh, it's going to take, uh, uh, take place within a potential energy, energy bill and uh, a potential transportation bill. Okay. So. okay. Um, I wanted to talk to, to have, uh, we'll, we'll have kind of discussion amongst participants in a minute, but I wanted to kind of go to, to Jed, who's done work on uh, a state bill called SB 375 in California, which was actually trying to change development patterns as a way of reducing greenhouse gases and, and energy use. And um, if you could give us a little summary of that. This is one of these sort of innovative projects that's going on at the state level. Um, but Jed has taken a very close look at it about what happens when we try to go in and do cross-cutting legislation. What are some of the effects that we get and do we get what we're looking for? Uh, let me also just add my thanks uh, for including me uh, here today. In California, uh, in 2008, uh, the state enacted uh, what was SB 375. The purpose of SB 375 uh, was both a policy and a procedural change to integrate land use and transportation planning in order to help achieve VMT reduction and ultimately reduce emissions. This is part of California's larger emissions reduction effort under AB 32. Uh, a significant portion of that, of course, is transportation, uh, and a portion of that is reducing driving. And this is the goal of SB 375. The mechanism of SB 375 is to better integrate land use and transportation planning, which are, of course, done at different levels uh, of government uh, and organizations. Transportation planning is done regionally by MPOs, land use planning by localities, by cities and counties. Uh, these two processes have traditionally uh, been less integrated uh, than they are now to be under SB 375. The policy intent is to use land use transportation uh, investments and pricing policies in order to uh, reduce per capita emissions and VMT and therefore emissions uh, at the regional level throughout California. Now this raises several important questions and, and most crucially I think for some of the conversation today uh, is it brings land use planning directly into the conversation about using transportation to reduce emissions. In California, there are, uh, there's been significant investment uh, in transit, uh, both in uh, the dense urban areas where you would expect, as well as some of the uh, more uh, outlying suburban uh, and exurban areas in California. What we see is that transit usage, uh, despite uh, the prevalence of transit, including much fixed line transit in California, uh, remains quite low. Uh, and even in, at very close proximity to many transit stations in California, we find that the vast majority uh, of commuters continue to drive to work and in fact drive alone to work. Uh, so if you look, for instance, uh, within just a quarter mile, people who work within a quarter mile uh, of a fixed line transit station, roughly only 10% uh, of those employees take transit to work, again, despite their incredible proximity to transit stations. This points out part of the impetus behind SB 375, uh, which is transportation investments or transportation policy alone uh, is not enough to achieve the types of VMT reduction uh, that would help achieve California's emission uh, reduction goals, rather requires greater integration, not only transportation, but also land use policy, uh, as well as pricing policies that have the potential to raise uh, the cost uh, of driving and parking or lower the availability of parking. Looking more closely, uh, as we've done recently uh, in the report that uh, you have copies of today uh, on the table just outside the room, we examined what has actually been California's experience in trying to integrate land use and transportation planning, particularly around transit-oriented development, uh, which has been uh, a push recently in California, uh, it gets uh, renewed effort under SB 375 uh, and in some ways uh, helps make the state more of a model uh, for other places trying to implement transit-oriented development. What we found in this work uh, is that the uh, 
transit-oriented development uh, has focused uh, traditionally in California and elsewhere uh, more on housing. Uh, and in fact, SB 375 uh, gives greater incentives uh, for localities to uh, uh, plan projects that are uh, majority housing near transit stations in order to lower uh, reductions. Uh, it turns out, though, uh, and this is uh, what we found, that it's the proximity of jobs to transit uh, that has even, an even greater potential to reduce VMT uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, employment density turns out to be much more strongly associated with transit usage, either at the metro area level or even at the very granular neighborhood level uh, than housing density is. More so, people are much more likely uh, to depend on proximity uh, of their workplace to transit than of their residence to transit. Uh, there are more options to chain a trip, uh, park and ride, uh, at the origin end of a transit trip than at the destination end. Uh, so people who uh, work, uh, sorry, people who live, say, a mile uh, from a transit station are much more likely to make their way to that transit station to begin their trip than people who work a mile from a transit station at the destination end. Uh, there are folks uh, who work uh, a mile or more from transit and still take transit to work uh, on the uh, peninsula in Silicon Valley uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, many companies do run shuttles uh, from transit stations to corporate campuses, but that's still relatively unusual. Uh, if you are trying to maximize uh, transit usage uh, and therefore lower VM and therefore uh, achieve greater VMT reductions, uh, it is more important to have jobs right near transit stations than it is to have housing right near transit stations in those cases where it's necessary to make a trade-off. And this is a scarce resource. Uh, the land uh, right near transit uh, is a scarce and precious resource. And even beyond a quarter mile, a very short distance, uh, people become quickly unwilling uh, to walk either from their homes or from their offices uh, at greater distances to use transit. This requires uh, somewhat of a shift in thinking about the integration of land use and transportation policy. Understandably, transit-oriented development has focused on housing uh, in the past, uh, certainly in California but also elsewhere, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, a California-specific reason uh, is uh, a shortage of affordable housing uh, in most parts of California, particularly where uh, there is transit. Uh, and of course, uh, those, uh, the, the people more likely to use transit are lower income uh, and are also uh, the audience for affordable housing. Um, however, uh, if we're thinking about VMT reduction uh, as an important goal of this kind of integration, it uh, wasn't always true in the past. Uh, I mean, California's long thought about integrating land use and transportation policy, uh, but that's been more about smart growth and reducing congestion. Uh, only recently has this also become, also included the goal uh, of emission reduction. Um, and if that is the primary goal uh, of this integration, and under SB 375 it is, uh, it turns out that the proximity of jobs to transit and focusing more of the development near transit stations on employment turns out to be more important, even more important, uh, than having high-density housing uh, in those areas. I mention all this about California uh, because SB 375, which again became law uh, about three years ago, 2008, uh, was uh, a model for uh, parts of the climate change legislation uh, at the federal level. Um, obviously, that didn't come to pass, uh, but any subsequent discussions uh, at the federal level or elsewhere uh, about TOD uh, and the integration of land use and transportation policy uh, is likely to look to this experience in California. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I think that your, some of your work has some implications for what we think of as a green job. Hmm. You know, uh, we've had a, a big push through the ERA funding and also through the, the Recovery Act funding, um, and also at the state levels to develop what we call green jobs. Um, but some of what you're talking about is sort of a different model for thinking about green jobs, a more integrated model of what a, uh, a green job would be. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Sure. There's uh, lots of debate over uh, what, what are green jobs, what that means. Uh, many uh, uh, areas in the U.S., uh, especially California, uh, have been very focused uh, in the 
from an economic development perspective, of trying to uh, develop or grab uh, or grow uh, nascent uh, green industries, however, however that's defined. Um, there are uh, lots of ways of thinking about what a green job is, though. Um, and uh, you know, a, a, if we were to think very holistically uh, about what the overall impact uh, of a job is um, on the environment, uh, you could equally well argue uh, that we should be thinking about land use and transportation as well. Uh, you could define a green job uh, as a job that you don't have to drive to. Uh, obviously, that's a very different kind of take on what green jobs are. Um, and you know, we, we can see this also uh, in talking about uh, where housing gets produced um, in the US. Um, there are uh, lots of green jobs, jobs that are defined as green jobs now that are involved in the uh, production of housing, uni uh, housing uh, using green technologies or sustainable materials, um, but much of that new development um, takes place far from transit um, and at low density. Uh, is it a green job uh, if uh, workers are commuting long distances uh, in order to build low density housing far from transit using sustainable materials? Well, sure, in some ways, yes, um, but in lots of important ways, no. Uh, and thinking about uh, this link between land use and transit um, and taking seriously uh, the uh, implications that transportation has uh, for emissions, uh, I think is a potential change the way we think about you know, what really is a green job uh, and green activities more generally. Thanks. Did you, do you have th um, things you'd like to interject in this? Oh. No, n I was just, I mean, I think that's incredibly important. I, and the main thing, too, which I think is a little bit lost, is just a fundamental principle of 80% of the, um, the 80 percent of the carbon emissions from the transportation sector come from the internal combustion engine. So the VMT aspect, reducing the VMT aspect of our current transportation system, which is very dependent on the car, is incredibly important. And it's sort of lost in the idea of employment and housing and I think land use, um, you know, commercial development versus residential development also happens very separately. So I was just nodding my head in agreement with that. Darren, did you have? Oh, uh, well, I, I just, I'm reminded of uh, a, a, an article that uh, uh, Bob Severo recently wrote, right, from University of California, Berkeley, about green TOD, so green transit-oriented development, and pointing out that uh, it's a, it, it's a two-way street that, TOD by definition is green, and it can be made uh, um, even greener if uh, uh, the building stock there is as efficient as possible, right? And if you have increases in vehicle efficiency and you have car sharing and you have a variety of, of techniques that you uh, uh, put in place to decrease uh, or to save more fuel and to decrease carbon footprints even further. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one, one of the things that's interesting to, to ponder is where um, green transit-oriented development is going if you don't include the jobs package in it. Um, one of the things that you can see in different places around the country is that there are part of our commute problem, we tend to blame it on sprawl, and, and we talk about sprawl as the issue, but partly it has to do with the enclaving of, of real estate values in that um, even in places where you traditionally had a uh, a, a mix of, of people of different incomes, what you've had is that some communities have become the upper income place and other communities have become the place where the workers in that area live. And you, uh, it was surprising to me this, this winter I ended up doing a bunch of interviews in coastal Maine, which has traditionally had a, a really wide mix. I mean, you can, you can look on a single street and have real estate values from a million dollars to a hundred thousand. <laughs> and and uh, you know the, the it was sort of the m it wasn't designed as a model of, of integration for by income but it, it became one um, because it was beautiful but then what you had was kind of a separation where certain communities had their their housing values rise quite dramatically and others stagnated because of of the community's particular um, politics and development patterns. And so what you have is basically the jobs are in the higher income communities because those are the ones that had the oomph to get themselves a hospital and to have the ambulance services and to have all of the other sorts of programs around there that would create jobs. And then the other communities, which are w basically where the workers end up living, um, 
you've had this kind of sorting procedure going on, and you also see that in California. And what you have when you have a lot of incentives for transit-oriented development is you're essentially creating somewhat higher value housing around this transportation. And, and there's even, you know, a deliberate thinking behind this that you would make it possible for people to own a more expensive home because it's near tra transit and they would be able to save money. But you have then this interesting problem of, okay, we've created this transit-oriented development, but where are the people who work in the cafes coming? Are they still coming from the old exurbs? Because the exurbs are still going to exist. And I think there's some interesting things that are brought up from your research. One thing I, I want to uh, mention, uh, I don't think in the introduction you mentioned I was an economist, uh, oh, which I'll, full disclosure, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but on the other and, hand. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, I th and, you know, economists, uh, myself included, would, you know, naturally first think about, you know, what the market forces are, what does transit do to uh, demand for uh, land, uh, what's the relative demand among uh, commercial users uh, and private households uh, for land near transit station and so on. Um, but this is clearly an area where uh, policy matters crucially, uh, and it is uh, sometimes blatantly obvious to see how policy decisions affect what TOD looks like and what land uses around transit are. And probably the best example anywhere is the Orange Line here in Virginia. Uh, what happens to it when it crosses uh, from Arlington to Fairfax counties uh, and what the Orange Line portion of Arlington looks like and what's around those stations uh, versus uh, the Fairfax County portion uh, that runs in the highway median uh, and therefore uh, has essentially no immediate development around it. Um, and uh, Zach Schrag, who's a, a historian who wrote a fantastic uh, book on the history of the Washington Metro, uh, documents very clearly that uh, there were uh, discrete decision points uh, when the uh, respective uh, uh, board of supervisors in the two counties uh, uh, had visions for what Metro might bring. Uh, and those two counties had very different visions. Uh, and that is today, you know, decades later, um, immediately obvious. Um, so overlay whatever market forces you want on this. Um, these are clearly policy decisions that are within the control and power of localities to make, um, and there's huge variation uh, in how they make those decisions. So uh, one, one of the questions I have is, uh, we think, of course, about em environmental sustainability, but given the debate that's happening right now in D.C. about the debt and the deficit, we're also thinking a lot about financial sustainability, and um, uh, this uh, questions about that apply in spades to to transit, uh, um, uh, which which uh, um, uh, I think you have to think of with with two conflicting thoughts in mind. First, um, it it needs to be uh, the program, the federal program, uh, and uh, um, probably state and local programs need to be reformed substantially. Uh, to make them more financially sustainable, and yet uh, um, it deserves a lot more investment. So yes, we should put more money into it, and we should also make sure that money is is not not being thrown away. Uh, um, uh, and with transit, uh, um, uh, one of the, the some of the figures I've come across recently are sobering. With, uh, um, when you con even when you control for inflation, uh, investment in transit. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, from 1991 to 2007, so since we passed the landmark Ice-T law in 1991, so in those in those years, it, it increased by half, 50 percent, and yet uh, in that time, uh, transit trips per capita barely budged, and fare box recovery on average actually dropped from 37 percent to 33 percent for transit agencies. Uh, that makes it a challenge to go out and say we really should be investing a lot more in transit. So the question is, and I think TOD is part of the response in doing smart TOD that where you actually get, are going to boost trips uh, um, taken and you're going to boost uh, a fare box recovery. I think that's one, you know, there are policy tools that can help to achieve that in order to make uh, transit more financially sustainable. I'd be interested, though, in, you know, uh, uh, discussing other ways um, to make uh, transit more sustainable. Do you have just, just one, one thing that um, you actually mentioned in talking about uh, 
gas prices, and that is you know the whole uh, the whole third piece of this. Uh, in addition to land use and transportation investments, uh, there's the pricing side, uh, and the deci the decision mode choice you know is a is a weighing of you know what are the costs and benefits, uh, monetary, time, other, uh, of different modes, uh, and uh, one of the types of strategies that uh, have helped uh, reduce driving in and around TODs uh, is uh, raising the price of driving and in particular parking. Um, and some of the policies specifically uh, in California uh, that have uh, resulted in reduced driving uh, around TODs uh, is reducing um, minimum parking requirements uh, for new developments around TOD, you know, acknowledging that uh, if a new housing uh, development is on top of a transit station, then uh, the regulations that require a minimum number of parking spaces per unit um, can probably be lowered or relaxed or eliminated uh, given the transit station there. Um, not subsidizing or not providing uh, as much parking at the workplace end. Uh, these are all tools that you know, may have no um, budgetary impact, uh, but clearly uh, change the relative benefit uh, of driving or driving alone um, and taking transit. Um, there's the broader discussion, of course, uh, for financial sustainability uh, of, you know, do we focus only on uh, fuel taxes uh, or on VMT taxes? Uh, and getting to Lisa's earlier point about uh, equity implications, uh, those types of taxes have very different, potentially, um, equity implications, as well as, uh, you know, complexities of implementation, privacy concerns, and so on. Um, but this, this, this seems to be one of those areas where um, policy wonks pretty much all agree, and politicians uh, and the voters who elect them uh, uh, have or acknowledge very strong opposition. Um, when, uh, as part of this work, we did a survey uh, of local uh, planning officials in most jurisdictions in California, uh, and they saw pricing tools uh, raising uh, the cost of driving, uh, particularly through uh, gas prices, uh, as uh, the tool with the highest potential um, to reduce VMT um, and the most underused uh, and potentially most strongly opposed. Uh, and so this is you know, one of those cases where kind of everyone knows what the right answer is, um, even if lots of people aren't in a position to say it or do it. <laughs> Reactions? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what this, actually the Transportation Solvency Project is attempting to address, is to create the leadership and the political space so that this conversation, the big elephant um, or the gorilla in the room or whatever is, can actually be addressed and, and acknowledged and you know, let's have an adult conversation about it. So um, why don't you, uh, yeah, but talk, we'll, we'll um, talk more about taxes after you're finished. I, this is a great time to introduce your, and your plan. There'll be a lot about taxes in, in this description, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, but essentially, you know, uh, they've, we have had the context. We spend more than we raise in the transportation program. We um, are not getting the benefits that we want to see from the transportation program. A lot of what we've been talking about with TOD is this real disconnect between the experience of um, making your mobility choices and how you're getting from place to place and then the policy that happens. Um, you know, one thing with transit I always find is there's a lot, the way the program is set up right now, it's, it's very focused on capital construction. It's not as focused on operations and maintenance. And operations and maintenance is what makes it great for transit riders. That's what makes that transit experience wonderful and can drive up ridership. When you don't have that, there isn't a reason to invest in capital. So um, there's definitely that. And, you know, we are, there's been transfers from the general fund to the transportation program as in the last few years, and so now we're deficit spending for a program that's not delivering. We have a very unwieldy sense of what the program offers. Um, in the 80s, President Reagan had vetoed a bill that had 100 earmarks, and recently George Bush uh, approved a bill that had over 6,000 earmarks. So now we're you know kind of ballooning the program. Um, earmarks do not need to go through any environmental review process. Um, so basically, it's, it's become very parochial, very politicized program. 
And at the same time, we're not weaning our dependence on foreign oil, on oil in general. We're still very much creating the system um, that we, that the original transportation program was set up to create the interstate highway system. So it's very much focused on highways. So the leadership initiative for transportation solvency is to create the political space so we can have this conversation. And it was really trying to pull together a nonpartisan independent analysis. We have three leaders who are at the helm of it. Bill Bradley, who um, uh, as a former senator spent 18 years looking at tax reform. Um, Tom Ridge, the uh, former Homeland Security Secretary, who was very interested in national security and energy security, um, has recently uh, been made a chair at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in national security, in some subcommittee on national security. And Dave Walker, who is our former Comptroller General, and very interested in um, fiscal health of the country, especially, we're talking about long term, you know, long term fiscal health. The way that things are going now, and you know, Darren was talking about this, we're, we're not heading we're not heading to a place where we're, t we're talking about long-term um, prosperity here. We're, a, lot, a lot of things seem to be converging, but I guess we like to take the view that it's also a great moment for opportunity. So what we are looking at is, you know, that we've done an analysis. I think there's been plenty of reports on reform for the transportation program, just building off of that, you know, we should make sure the funding is solvent. We should make sure there isn't waste in the programs. We should make sure uh, maybe some of the new elements is to integrate energy and um, energy security issues and environmental issues. So comprehensive land use and transportation planning is one of their recommendations. Um, and then the pricing. So finally, you know, we looked, we originally looked at this very broadly. There's very, there are many different pricing options. We think that, um, again, a transportation system is necessarily very, has a very close relationship to pricing because it's a public good and people need to have some kind of signal that c helps them make a decision that benefits, uh, has greater benefits for the public. So because, you know, right now there's such a great distance between the gas tax, which is essentially, fun, you know, it funds our transportation program. Um, and what is being done with the funding and the choices that they have. There's such a great distance from that. People have a really hard time understanding that they need to pay for what they use to a certain degree. I'm not saying, you know, with, there's definitely equity issues. I'm not saying that everyone should pay the full cost because there is some, there are greater benefits to having a very functional transportation system that everyone benefits from. But, um, but there has to be a uh, closer relationship to that. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, the gas tax, but also distributing the cost of the transportation program along the entire value chain of oil production. So there, the new part of it is, the, uh, is trying to think about some kind of fee at the upstream level so that the um, producers also have to carry some of the cost of our dependence on oil, essentially, because the transportation system is 95% dependent on oil. And the idea right now, it's still being worked out, the details are still being worked out, but the idea is that because the country is subject to world oil prices and we're subject to the spikes in the, in the valleys, um, we want to kind of stabilize and cut those tops and the bottoms off. And so as world oil prices go up, um, there would be an increase. Uh, it, essentially for the consumer, it would feel like it's, it's the same tax on gas. But there would be an increase in, um, in for the producer. And as the world oil prices go down, there might be a, a decrease for the producer and an increase in the consumer so that Overall, there's, it's a very stable, the effect is very stable for consumers. Can I ask you a question just sure. to clarify this? So I think that what you're saying is that you're basically going to set, you're going to, the way to fund the highway program is to basically set a gasoline price at, let, let's just, for the sake of argument, say 450. And that when the price of gas is, is 350, 
a dollar is a tax that goes to the government. And when the price, I uh, when the market price of gas, and when the market price of gas is say um, 4.75, uh, there is no tax coming in at that point. Is that is that correct? So you, you've got this kind of a variable tax, but you've set a price for right. gasoline that's predictable. Right. So there's a there's a set price, but it's actually uh, set to crude oil. Mm -hmm. So not so not the retail price. Okay. Yeah. But that's sort of the that's the concept we're working with right now is a variable price that kind of spreads distributes the cost, and we're working out all the there there as you think about how this could work there are levers that you can you know the percentage could be different going to the producers the um, the trigger let's say the trigger price the median price that you you might say a transportation program needs this amount of money to be solvent and to do all the things we want to do, to do the DOD, to do the comprehensive land use planning, to do the transit. And we, we need this much money, so it needs to be at this price at the middle, and then you can set the variations on either side. This is a concept we're working with. Um, but the and, I, can, oh, and the, the, I think there's, a, there's, there's two aspects of this. One is the, the effect upon the landscape and on us, the, the lab rats here, mm -hmm. um, driving with our VMT. But the other, the other aspect has to do with um, as you said, uh, uh, building political space or um, uh, giving us a reason to do something like this. And, and I think that the, your initiative is very, very interesting because it sort of it adds an extra problem and then provides kind of a larger solution. <laughs> so could give us the, the <laughs> political space part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that um, having the leaders and having their, seeing that they're able to collaborate and and strongly support this concept is has been already helpful that they have very different networks they they can represent different parts of the political spectrum um, and be willing to go to the mat for it is also uh, very important and I think also the idea you know they're not transportation people they they believe in the long-term future of the country I mean they're they're beyond they're sort of beyond that so they don't have anything necessarily to personally gain from supporting this project. They just want to, they, they see it. And you know, I have to say, to be totally fair, the transportation program is a tiny piece of our overall federal budget. It's, a, it's even a small piece of, a, of our discretionary budget. Mm -hmm. However, it is a really good demonstration program to show how a program can be solvent. There can be um, better pricing, right pricing, pay as you go for the for the services that are provided by the federal program. So they really they've really supported this idea, the idea of um, cutting waste, but also not saying that we shouldn't have a federal role, and not saying you know they believe in the federal role. They believe in continued investment in transportation. Um, they can take a global view. They can. You know, we uh, we basically invest about two percent of our GDP now in infrastructure. And by comparison, China, the other major global emitter of carbon, invests nine percent. Um, our populations are obviously very different, but we our population is still growing, and we have there's uh, it was a recent report about you know maintaining our level of productivity. It, and it, we need both efficiency, so cutting out the waste and doing more with what we have, as well as increasing our productivity rate. So we need to actually find new ways of um, generating economic activity. Uh, so we, you know, I think the leaders really believe that this that transportation is an underpinning of of that activity and of our future growth. Um, and it seems to me part of the political space has to do with the sense that people on both sides of the aisle have some incentive to do something about the deficit. Exactly, that right? sorry, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, so the def obviously the deficit is a huge um, timely conversation that's happening right now and one of the, we originally started this project targeting the Fiscal Responsibility Commission that was established last February. They came out with their recommendations in December and um, they actually advocated for many of the things that we uh, were hoping that they would include. Um, 
that uh, there would be a gas tax increase, actually, as Darren said, and that the, that the core programs of the federal program would be consolidated, that there would be less waste. Um, so, you know, that was, that was really, that helps keep the conversation going, takes it away from, I think, some of these polarizing issues about you know how do we how do we travel who you know should we be should we should we be paying for it more than we can, we have already you know i think household budgets really feel the impact but it kind of goes towards the longer term the long view if you can talk about it within a deficit frame do other panelists have thoughts on on the feasibility of taxes of a gas tax <laughs> um, uh, well, well, putting it, I mean, it's an intriguing proposal, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it'll, it'll, it'll make headway. <laughs> and it is helpful that the, the, the three uh, leaders at the, the masthead of, of your project are not, um, well, they're not highway contractors or transit contractors, to be frank. They, they really don't have, uh, you know, a, 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 a personal profit to be gained from this, and that, that is, a detriment right now, um, uh, especially in the House, uh, um, uh, in the Tea Party Caucus especially, and I think that's that's part of the reason why you see the very the, the scathing treatment this program received in, in Congressman Ryan's proposal for the budget. So, because it is perceived as a, a, a pork barrel program. Exactly. Uh, um, dominated by bridges to nowhere style earmarks. So, the, I mean, the, the, uh, um, uh, so the the fact that these leaders are, are you know, and, and they're they're uh, um, they're towering leaders in terms of intellect and and clout. So that that's helpful, and the proposal is clever enough where I, I hope it makes headway. It, it it's it's going to be tough though. It's gonna, you know, as you all know, it's yeah. it's going to be tough, and it's. Um, you know, it's it's probably going to take it's probably going to take a, a a while to uh, uh, get a revenue increase enacted in 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 whatever form. So, but I, so I think I, yeah, oh, just a, yeah, a couple a couple thoughts about um, uh, gas tax and gas prices uh, in particular. Uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of policy goals uh, that uh, gas taxes achieve. Uh, one is increasing revenue. Uh, in order to fund uh, transportation, whether that means highways, transit, something else, or altogether different things. Um, the other is uh, essentially to reflect uh, the externality imposed by driving uh, and by fuel consumption uh, and to discourage that. Now, uh, on that second one, um, the uh, discouraging of driving to reduce VMT and emissions, um, higher gas prices uh, from the market price um, achieve that just as well as an increase in taxes do. Um, and uh, it's likely that any politically feasible increase in gas taxes will probably be much smaller than uh, the fluctuations we see uh, in gas prices um, even over the short term. Um, and so uh, it's unclear how much uh, any politically feasible change in gas taxes can do uh, given the fluctuation in gas prices generally, um, to have a permanent effect on driving uh, behaviors and uh, emissions reductions. But the question may not end up being so much what's the right level, but also what's the right duration. Because uh, we know that the types of behavioral changes uh, that people will make in response uh, to higher gas prices, whether those higher prices are due to increased taxes, increase market prices or something else, um, depends a lot on how long that duration of that increase is likely to be. Um, if it's expected to be short, people might <coughs> carpool short term, just pay more, um, or uh, make other sort of temporary changes. But only if an increase is expected to be long term do people start thinking uh, that they want to live closer to their jobs, uh, drive a more fuel efficient car, move closer to transit. Uh, the, the long run behavioral changes people uh, would be inclined to make uh, are very different than those that they might be willing to make in the short run. Um, so much of the discussion focuses on uh, what the size uh, of a tax or what the level of price might be, um, but it also matters how long a time horizon we're talking about. Um, and you know that's, that's very different whether we're talking about 
uh, tax increases, relying on uh, fluctuations of the market price, uh, or some combination. I, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, a, cu a couple of things come to mind. One is that I, I was interviewing, a w I've been talking to extreme commuters recently, people who commute more than an hour each way. I was talking to a woman who is a, a, a fire person in San Francisco and commutes from outside of Sacramento, California. So that's 125 miles each way. Now, uh, the, the positive thing here is that she's commuting to a three shift, a 24 hour shift. So it's basically three days work with one day of commute. But still, we're talking 250 mile commute. And I, I said, well, what, uh, she said this was fine because what she wanted was a really big house. And at one point she'd had one that had six bedrooms and four bathrooms. And that was before she had the kids. So, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so her priori she had a distinct set of priorities um, and also was focused on the school systems and um, the walking distance between the house and the school. So these were her priorities and, and the commute didn't matter that much. So I said, well, how, how much, what, at what gas price are you gonna get annoyed? Uh, four dollars said nah. Five said no. Six, no. And you know, by this time, normally people are becoming irate when I'm asking them this sort of question. <laughs> I said, well, seven. And she said, look, it. I'm just. I, I, it doesn't matter to me what the gas prices are. I know exactly what I want, and I don't live paycheck to paycheck. And that was kind of the end. I didn't actually get to go to eight dollars a gallon. It, but th the thing is, is that for some people, the the price signals to change behavior are going to wreck the rest of the economy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so y you may actually, we, one of the things I've thought about is can you combine small price signals that are essentially symbolic that bring in revenue and at the same time give people messages, say, at the gas pump about the, the cost of oil dependence or some of these other um, ser messages about changing their behavior, about where they could call to get information about getting more choices for their commute or um, the role of um, gasoline use in air pollution and the, the cost per gallon. Some of the, educate about the externalities at the same time that you sort of administer a small and rising tax. Um, I, I'm kind of curious to th hear about other ideas that you have about taxes and, and also how you feel people would respond to the variable tax, shouldn't they? Well, I mean, I think that I th you know, you're absolutely right. The uh, price signal has to be extremely high to get, as a, po it, as a policy, has to be extremely high to get a behavior change. But it is symbolic. And, and the reason I think um, we keep on latching on to the idea that even an incremental price would be better than nothing is because people are so up in arms about even the smallest increases in general, let's say. So beyond the six-bedroom house in the excerpts. Um, uh, one of the ways that we're thinking about this variable tax is as an oil security fee because the burden on the country and a macroeconomic level of supporting our dependence on oil is incredibly high. And not, our deficit, you know, at, at, by our estimates, our con the, the contribution to the deficit now is $175 million, sort of between the trans direct transfers, opportunity cost, deferred maintenance. Um, and then the cost of just the system borne by other agencies um, who provide some transportation services. Uh, but then the amount of money that we send overseas, um, I think is something like, and Darren knows better than me, but a billion dollars a day or something that we send overseas. And <laughs> That's about right, right. Is, that, is that about right? right okay, now, yeah. yeah, right now. Uh, many of them to unstable countries. I mean, it's, it, part of this is thinking about protecting growing being protecting ourselves at the same time we're that we're able to grow the economy so do we want to keep on sending that much money overseas and to countries that are I think 50 nearly 50 percent of that money goes to countries that are considered uh, classified as unstable by the State Department you know we're trying you know with Tom Ridge on this team we're trying to like wedge in these other global ideas kind of get at the macro level of thinking to, you know, we're trying to, it's it's creating the space. I actually am not sure how it would go over. Um, I know that there was a recent poll that said that people, I think 75% of people believe, or 74, if you want to get uh, really accurate, is um, 
people believe that we can need to continue to make transportation investments for future economic growth, and that's very important. At the same time, 65% of those people said that they don't believe that we're currently doing that now. And then, and then you ask them how you're going to pay for it, and it's like, well, no one wants to pay for it. <laughs> so it's, We don't want to pay for the gas either. It's we're no trying to deal. push <laughs> all these issues together on, in the same room. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, just, just walking through just historically the politics of this, this is, this is uh, um, tough, um, to put it mildly. First, going back the furthest in 1982, I think that was the last time a president took the case for an increased gas tax directly to the country, and that was President Reagan, of course, working with the Democratic Congress to push for an increase in user fees for transportation. Um, and there was a deal cut uh, between urban Democrats and the Reagan administration and Republicans in Congress to have one cent out of the five cent a gallon gas tax increase go to a new mass transit account that would be cabined off in the Highway <laughs> Trust Fund. Um, and then there were increases in 90 and 93, but I'd be hard pressed uh, to, to find an instance where either uh, President Bush or President Clinton actually mentioned the fact that there was a gas tax increase <laughs> included in either one of those bills. Um, and you need presidential leadership on this. And frankly, um, uh, well, uh, uh, in terms of the lack of uh, a, a, a gas tax increase, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that would recover some of this revenue, as, as Shin Pei says, so we can invest it domestically as opposed to being subjected to these, this price volatility and these high prices that uh, basically require us to pay uh, a high price and have, uh, um, you know, much of it go overseas, including to nations where we, we prefer it not to go. You know, um, uh, um, I mean, you'd, you'd have to look in the Clinton years for the last time that we had a real opportunity to put in place uh, some sort of gas tax increase that would help us uh, to reduce dependence on oil and that would help us to, you know, if we wanted, and we're interested in industrial policy and really moving away aggressively from this, uh, this resource, both by, a, through a price signal coupled with investments of the revenue that are uh, done creatively uh, uh, in order to move us in that direction. The reason I say that is in the late 90s, people may not remember this, but I mean, there were, there was a year where gas prices dropped below a dollar a gallon, <laughs> uh, and that's when we should have done it. That's when we should have moved forward. And now it's, you know, we're in this 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 tough uh, dilemma where, uh, you know, now more than ever we need to move away from this resource. And part of the way to get there is to put in place uh, a, a, a gas tax increase or some sort of oil security fee. And it's 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 a it's tougher than ever to make the case right now because of how much people are paying at the gallon uh, uh, for gas. And one thing I'd say, though, is there is, um, I'd actually divide these two purposes uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, some sort of fee or some sort of tax. You don't need a, a substantial increase to generate a lot of revenue that could do a lot of good uh, if invested uh, creatively. Um, uh, uh, so revenue raising requires a much less, uh, a much less of a political lift. I mean, to state the obvious, than sending a genuine price signal uh, with demand uh, in this area being uh, um, uh, so inelastic. Um, uh, uh, much as you know, on a chalkboard, we might like to do the latter. Uh, I would settle for the former, uh, as long as the revenue is invested in a way that actually uh, productively moves us away from this resource. So, anyway. Yeah, I want to go back to your um, extreme commuter um, <laughs> traveling the 125 miles each way to San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and it raises the question, you know, what are the policy choices uh, that result in uh, this person or others um, making extreme commutes? And we you know we, we hear these examples around lots of metropolitan areas. Uh, and if this person is somewhat or completely impervious uh, to uh, gas prices, and if the economist in me says, you know, this person's probably not quite as impervious as they made themselves out to be, yeah. but, you know, could be close. Uh, but there are a range of other policies that would encourage somebody to make a decision to make extreme commutes. Um, the mortgage interest deduction uh, encourages greater consumption uh, of housing and bigger housing, which tends to be found uh, farther away from employment centers. Um, land use regulations uh, in cities raise the cost and lower the availability of housing. Uh, and when we look at where new housing has been constructed, um, particularly in the boom of the last decade, 
uh, they tended to be in places uh, farther from jobs because the places closer to jobs uh, were much more constrained in terms of the supply of housing, uh, partly due to regulation, partly due to market, uh, other market forces, uh, that result in uh, lots of policies, not just low gas taxes, uh, that encourage these kinds of extreme commuting. And when we talk about um, questions of equity as well, uh, it tends to be that the most expensive places uh, in the U.S. Uh, where uh, housing prices are highest uh, tend to be closest to major job centers, um, so near downtowns on coasts. Uh, they also tend to be uh, the places where uh, housing density is higher, uh, therefore uh, the energy requirements per capita of dwellings uh, are lower. Um, they also tend to be the places where climate is milder. Uh, and so the emissions uh, that are generated uh, for heating and cooling um, tend to be less. Uh, so lots of factors result in uh, lower income people ending up uh, choosing or having to choose uh, to live in regions of the country uh, that uh, impose a greater burden on the environment through transportation, uh, heating and cooling, and a range of factors. Um, again, some of this is policy driven uh, in terms of uh, land, use, land use regulation being strictest, uh, typically in coastal places um, that uh, would otherwise be uh, the least burdensome places uh, to build uh, from an environmental perspective. Uh, but uh, also because of market forces, that those are also the places that are in greater demand, uh, and even the absence of policy interventions would be more expensive anyway. So in other words, the, the, so part of solving the energy problem is looking at credit. And, and land, I mean, it, you're, you're talking about, a, what, what I love is now we've just ended up with like a, a giant need to sort of manage housing and, and, oh, and jobs across I mean, since, the country. It's, since, it's, I mean, since the gas tax is clearly so politically challenging, I thought we'd <laughs> shift to something <laughs> easier <laughs> like the mortgage interest We're deduction. the mortgage interest <laughs> yeah, deduction. Yeah, that's a <laughs> you know, much easier way out of this. <laughs> um, I want to break for, for um, questions. Uh, and, and one thing I'd like to, to kind of keep in mind as, as we um, go to questions is, is thinking about sort of paradoxical causes for hope. Um, and uh, la <laughs> it, last week, I, I, um, I, I don't know why I agreed to do this, but nine months ago, someone asked me to come talk about sustainability, but I had to drive 125 miles to do it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Anyway, so I, I was up there, and it turned out to be this um, city of 105,000 people, which uh, has basically grown over the last 20 years. It's the most inefficient thing you can imagine. Um, it's, it's done up on a grid. You, you can't walk to anywhere. Um, you, uh, the houses are all, it, it's, it was driven by the fact that there was cheap land and the, the city made money on the development. Um, the, the development is the city's business. Uh, the other city business is, um, malls and, uh, car, car sales. Mm -hmm. And that is how they have, the, the, the city is in a sense a corporation. It's not built on the concept of commuting. It's out in the middle of, of a very hot place. You need tons of air conditioning. You need tons of water to do the kind of landscaping that people want around these large houses. Um, and uh, aside from the malls, there aren't really very many jobs there. So um, this is kind of a, if you're kind of a policy wonk, this is fairly depressing. But at the same time, there is kind of a paradoxical hope to it, which is that if you can build this in 20 years, then you could actually build something good you could build something that used the energy well in 20 years if you had the incentives in the right place. And it's tremendously hopeful for policy. I, uh, the other weird thing about this place is that they were preparing for Earth Day at, at the little um, city-sponsored sort of sustainability institute. Mm -hmm. And 5%, last year, 5% of the town showed up for Earth Day. That's kind of nuts. Um, you know, this is, there's a, whatever is going on in in Washington, and whatever is going on at the sort of political level of the policy, there's this tremendous interest um, at the sort of local and personal level in doing something about what's been done, essentially. There's some, there's some interest in changing things, or, I mean, enough to get people to come downtown. 
five percent of a city of 105,000 showing up for Earth Day, I think, is kind of weird and amazing. Um, of course, they're probably driving. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that to me is it's sort of a paradoxical cause for hope, is that if whatever can be, you know, th there's a lot that this country can do in 20 years when we put our minds to it and when we have the policy p things in, in place. So as, as you answer audience questions, I would keep in mind paradoxical causes for hope. Yes, in the middle. Excuse me. Last week we heard a talk here about 23 things they don't tell you about c capitalism. And uh, in there it pointed out uh, this has to do with the pricing and where the uh, pricing uh, levers might be. Uh, the speaker pointed out the non-productive aspects of trading in stocks and stock markets. And uh, the money really doesn't go into, in that case, go into creating ec valuable economic activity. Uh, how much of the pricing of oil has to do with the traders and the commodity markets as opposed to the supply and demand? And he was advocating for the counter-economic activity of the stocks, uh, a, a, a tax, uh, a small tax, but nevertheless one that takes away all the rapid non-productive transactions. And have you, any of you, th thought of addressing the trading aspects of barrels of oil and the non-productive uh, aspects that drive pricing? Uh, okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. We can we can talk about uh, about uh, non-productive pricing of oil later. Um, I I will say that people don't get upset about how the oil market works when they consider the price is low. And it's all the same oil market. It's a, the the high prices and the low prices are both the the um, result of a tremendous amount of liquidity and and a huge number of trades and a huge w number of people willing to buy and sell that oil. Many of whom have no productive interest in the oil. And if we went back to just the refineries buying and selling oil, we would be looking at a very different kind of market. And it's not apparently one that we want because we certainly didn't lock them all out of the out of the trade. But um, we can talk about that one afterwards because that's sort of not the the um, focus of this. Uh, it was kind of too implicit assumption in the whole discussion here uh, that I wanted to challenge and see what your thoughts are. Number one is that uh, oil prices are likely to go down, and that's why we need other tools, taxation, other signals to impact behavior. And for a few fundamental reasons, that probably is not the case. Uh, most importantly, growing uh, consumption of oil around the world, mostly China. I don't, I don't think anyone here assumes that they're going down. Well, so, but this we'll whole talk, idea we of needing to taxation to set up a floor actually assumes that. So that's, that was a one point. And the second point is that, I don't know if this works. And the second point is that driving means oil and driving always would mean oil, and we need some kind of public transportation to get off oil. And my simple question is, all infrastructure here, all value system, all system is built around the car. Isn't it more productive to think about electric car rather than thinking that we can some kind of change people and make them uh, use public transportation? Yeah, I could, well, first of all, I, I uh, um, I, I make no assumptions about volatile commodity prices. I, I tend to agree with uh, a Department of Energy projections that we're going to see uh, um, uh, pretty high prices as far as the eye can see, but I don't think anybody can say that for certain. Uh, the Department of Energy's track record of projecting prices is particularly dismal. So, <laughs> And volatile or, or commodity markets are, are notoriously volatile, so it's not a, a sure thing that prices are going to uh, uh, um, uh, stay high forever. Um, although I, th I think it's a decent bet. So that's the first thing I'd say. The, the second thing I, I'd, I'd say is that, uh, um, uh, and this is NRDC's perspective. I don't know if this is anyone else's perspective. I mean, um, given uh, the scale of the challenge, uh, which is a, a 19 million, million barrel a day uh, a consumption level um, uh, uh, for liquids, most of which are petroleum and most of which is due to uh, transportation sector activity, uh, almost 70 percent of which, as a matter of fact, is due to transportation sector activity in this country. We think um, 
uh, uh, we, we think that uh, moving forward with uh, uh, electrification of uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled is not inconsistent with the idea of uh, um, moderating vehicle miles of travel and actually uh, uh, investing in uh, um, uh, mobility choices for people in addition to fuel or energy choices for how they run their cars. I mean, just to, uh, um, I mean, for me, that the simplest thing that I always imagine is I, I have a, a three-year-old daughter, and I imagine, uh, um, uh, I don't like imagining her driving, but uh, 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 I imagine when she is driving uh, 20 years from now th that I, I'd like her to have a car that can, uh, that's pluggable uh, um, uh, and fuel efficient in terms of what it's made of and in terms of the technology under the hood. Um, and uh, that she can fuel from liquids other than uh, petroleum-based ones, such as uh, advanced sustainable biofuels. And I'd like her to have uh, the choice of uh, um, uh, telecommuting or uh, um, uh, uh, through telecommunications, uh, um, uh, reducing the amount of trips she has to make, and doing that as well through uh, um, uh, walking and biking and taking transit. So I'd like her to have a whole array of uh, fuel and mobility choices, and um, I would argue that most people in America don't have that right now, and it's part of the problem we face. And just to underscore that, I, I, for me at least, we have a problem of the oil intensity of the transportation system that we need to drive down over time to make it more resilient to price uh, volatility and sustained price increases, and we need more flexibility. We need to be able to save oil in a hurry, basically, as the International Energy Agency puts it. We need the ability to shift to substitute fuels and to shift uh, to alternative ways of making meeting our daily needs quickly. Because um, uh, um, uh, given the volatility of the marketplace, I mean, who's to say that, uh, as, as Lisa was asking this person who did not get annoyed at it, most people would, that, got, that prices won't go up to, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a gallon before we see real, uh, real demand destruction that pulls it down again, uh, um, uh, and, you know, we need to be able to react to that uh, uh, in, in, we need more flexibility in terms of transportation, and we just don't have that right now. Uh, there's a dearth of substitutes in the sector in terms of both fuel and mobility. So that's a, a mouthful, but that's... Did, did you have a response, or Shinpei, did you have yeah, a response? Just a uh, quick response. Um, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between uh, policies and goals. Um, and uh, on one hand, uh, there are lots of paths to emissions reduction, even within the transportation sector, uh, and in California, uh, which is uh, very far along in this push to reduce uh, VMT. Uh, there are also numerous other uh, initiatives underway, uh, including uh, uh, fuel efficiency standards, lower emission vehicles, uh, and so on, uh, to reduce uh, emissions from the transportation sector uh, through other means. The other point of that, just as there are many policies to achieve a goal, um, some individual policies have the potential to achieve many goals. Um, and so even aside from emission reduction, uh, the discussion that we've had today about uh, reducing uh, driving, reducing BMT, um, has uh, potential benefits uh, in terms of congestion, um, which uh, doesn't get solved at all uh, through the same number of vehicles uh, that are zero emissions. Um, not to mention whatever additional public health, uh, community development, uh, and other benefits there are uh, that people expect to see from uh, less car-dependent driving-dependent com communities. Um, so uh, multiple, multiple policies get to a goal. Um, a single policy leads to multiple goals, uh, not at all mutually inconsistent. Thanks. It, right here in the sort of yeah, mauve-colored shirt. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Michelle Ruth, and I am uh, the energy policy person for the American Jewish Committee. And um, I find myself at an interesting nexus because on the one hand, I'm in forums like these with energy policy experts and transportation policy experts. And then on the other hand, or on the other hand, I'm talking with bubbies from Yonkers. And I find it interesting to try and translate some of these issues to people who aren't necessarily 
involved in this issue on a day-to-day -day basis, so I have actually two questions. The first is, what have you found to be the most persuasive arguments for um, VMTs and sustainable uh, transportation development to people who aren't necessarily in involved in these issues? And the second is, um, I found it interesting the discussion on localities having uh, the greatest impact in different uh, mobility options. So are there any specific examples that you've seen of grassroots organizations who have been successful in um, having an, a greater impact on making more sustainable uh, transportation development? Uh, so j a quick thing about persuasive elements. One thing is to sit people down and talk to them about their individual, how much their transportation is actually costing them. People tend to think that the car doesn't cost them anything more than the price of filling up, and that freaks them out. But if you start there, and then you go into the cost of the car and the financing and the other things, you start to develop kind of a whole picture of what that is costing them. and. Um, uh, so that is one thing, and, and also talking about how much it costs other people to commute also strikes people once they understand what the burden is for other families and can imagine that. Um, one, one figure in the U.S. is that uh, a household making 50000 a year spends $8,000 on their transportation, which is more than taxes and more than health care. Um, and so it's, it's an issue that hasn't been dealt with politically as, as a, a whole cost. Um, we tend to just sort of isolate out the gasoline and talk about that as, a, as an issue of drilling versus um, high-speed rail. And, and those are kind of false choices. Well, on the um, grassroots advocacy, sustainable transportation side, I think the, there are lots of organizations out there. And I think what makes a difference with the Bubbies and Yonkers are um, looking at local organizations. And there's, there's actually a coalition, an umbrella organization, I think, called the Alliance for Walking and Biking. And they basically have member organizations of grassroots advocacy transportation folks. Um, but I think really what makes a difference there are those demonstration projects that are happening throughout the country right now where they're really kind of tweaking with street space in a temporary way to show people how the street can be experienced differently. So for example, even in Dallas, there's a Better Blocks program where they some business owners um, work together to take parking away and create little parks in front of their stores. And they saw so much activity from this little demonstration project that they are working with the city now to make this part of policy. And I, th I think that experience, you know, so the cost thing is something that's kind of invisible and people don't, they don't think about internalizing that aspect of it. And then the other, the other part is the experience of seeing that things can be different. And I, I think that's a very individual experience and happens in lots of different ways around the country. So just very, I actually, very quickly, and then uh, I'm hoping that Jed will actually have ca cal California examples. Just one quick uh, uh, idea on the rhetoric is uh, um, uh, talking about the fact that, that uh, people do deserve choices, consumers deserve choices in terms of mobility, in terms of fuel, resonates. What doesn't resonate, and it makes it drives me up a wall whenever he says it, uh, um, is, uh, uh, you know, a Secretary of Transportation saying we need to get people out of their cars. <laughs> As a, a highway user who also enjoys taking transit and walking and biking, uh, that gets under my skin, and I can't imagine how much it gets under other people's skin. And that's not, you know, that's not the end goal. Uh, uh, um, so anyway, not th it sounds terrible. So anyway. Totally worth acknowledging um, how important driving is um, to most Americans. Um, and, you know, th my own Zadie stories of, you know, not giving up driving, you know, is a whole related but other set of issues. Um, I think there are a couple, right, telling people, you know, to drive less, clearly, you know, not a useful, constructive, or likely successful sort of message. Um, uh, People often experience this in terms of greater convenience. Um, for instance, uh, being able to uh, do shopping in the same complex where they work, whether they took transit to their job or drove to their job, um, 
having some mixed use development um, so that uh, it's not additional car trips to get to uh, quick retail between home and work um, is the type of change that uh, people would perceive as greater convenience um, might or might not be aware of that being a reduction in VMT, um, but uh, is clearly something that most people would prefer um, to get you know errands done in fewer trips rather than more. Um, I think the other thing that resonates, and this gets back to um, uh, one thing Lisa mentioned uh, about the community uh, in the Outer Bay Area, um, is the public health side of this often resonates with people. Um, you know, being able, and you know, this does not mean everybody's going to be biking to work. Uh, there are lots of people who uh, are not able, for whatever reason, to like get on a bicycle to their job. Um, you know, we need to acknowledge that. Um, but uh, the uh, public health uh, benefits that people perceive of wanting to uh, walk more, uh, be less, uh, spend less time in their car, um, is also the sort of thing that you know can resonate. Um, the other, you know, the other sort of grassroots thing that came up. Um, uh, is the whole car sharing movement, um, which uh, has, you know, is no longer cutting edge by any means, um, but uh, is uh, a way of people um, certainly owning fewer cars, um, a way that people are able to uh, sort of rely uh, less completely on cars, perhaps make different uh, housing or work decisions. Um, and, and so it's, a, it's an example of uh, a way of thinking uh, less about, um, you know, starting from an assumption of complete car dependence um, to one that is not a question of less choice of taking something away, but greater flexibility and additional option, um, which may then lead to uh, reduced driving at the household level. Um, and and, and yep. part of the moral of car sharing is that you can do something else with that money because most of the time the car is sitting in the driveway somewhere. It's, we spend very little amount of time actually on the road. Um, the next question, yes, you behind. Yes. Um, I am from the Embassy of Liechtenstein, and um, you talked about in incentives. And so I would like to have you respond on in Liechtenstein, we have now about seven or eight dollars a gallon, the price, the gas price. We have a very elaborated transport system. We have a very close distance between the house and the job, and I can't see any behavior changes from reducing um, to use the cars and, and to drive. So what would you respond on that? <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, um, do you know what the per capita kilometers driven is and how that compares to other countries? Because you may not be able to see, because even in, I mean, you know, to be fair, uh, um, anecdotally, qualitatively, uh, it may look, an area may look congested because people want to own cars, people are still going to want to drive, and yet you may have, comparatively, a lot less driving per per person. Uh, um, uh, I know the U.S. is, you know, when well, you look at a bar graph, we're way above a lot of other countries, and I would guess we're way above Liechtenstein, I too. I think D.C. is a really great example of that. The average vehicle miles traveled in, in Washington, D.C. is, is 6,000 per capita. Um, and so, and you look out the window, and it looks like everybody's on the road, and, and no one's going anywhere, and the taxi drivers are complaining. But um, the, the VMT for, for Wyoming is 18,000. Um, because there's no public transit. So it, what looks crowded may be different. And also people from Liechtenstein, I, I don't know, maybe they want to go to another country and drive around. <laughs> and buy gas. <laughs> and buy gas. <laughs> They're all leaving. <laughs> They're all going to buy gas. <laughs> okay. Um, um, just, just yes. It's, it's um, often hard to make cross-country comparisons uh, because uh, the responsiveness to gas prices will also depend on what land use patterns look like, uh, where jobs are, uh, and these things change very slowly over time. Um, you know, to, to make any sort of noticeable change in density or land use patterns, uh, given that we're talking about the built environment that, you know, turns over very slowly, um, a very long-term process with lots of historical factors. Um, but the other thing about why uh, Americans might be more sensitive uh, to changes in gas prices 
um, than others uh, is, first of all, we drive more to begin with. Uh, and so uh, 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 for any given um, uh, monetary increase uh, in the cost of driving, uh, there will be that will represent a bigger share of total income and expenditure. The other thing is Americans are much more mobile in terms of willingness to move house, uh, change jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if a long-term response uh, to different uh, gas prices um, might be different decisions about uh, where people live in relation to their workplace uh, in a more mobile country, uh, you might see greater responsiveness um, than in places where uh, people are much less likely to uh, move house, change job, move town. Um, the guy right beside you. Yes, uh, no, the one in front. That one. Yes. Uh, Jim Sang. Uh, Glenn Hubbard, whose right wing credentials are pretty good, I guess, has actually uh, supported the idea of uh, tax on fuel to smooth fluctuations on the basis that uh, the fluctuations make, for example, in the case of corporate investments, very hard, very hard to justify long-term investments. When you guys do your community planning, to what extent, uh, what kind of impact do large fluctuations in uh, fuel prices uh, change the economic viability of uh, the kind of uh, transit uh, com uh, community and uh, office mixes that you deal with? Um, so I, I myself am not involved in those types of planning exercises, and so I, I'm, I, I can't speak to uh, how sensitive uh, the plans and assumptions are. Uh, to expectations, um, but uh, I'll go back to the earlier point uh, that it depends a lot on uh, what the duration uh, of those price changes are expected to be. Um, fluctuating um, and perhaps short-term uh, spikes uh, in prices um, would have a very different effect, especially if we're talking about long-term planning, uh, than uh, the expectation of uh, a sustained or permanent uh, much higher uh, level uh, of fuel prices. Um, and so, you know, it's not, it's not just a question of uh, the levels of the fluctuations, but also the duration uh, of that. But uh, I don't have anything more specific than that on how that affects uh, planning processes. Sorry. I don't think it has an I, I think when it comes to the, the, let's say, the private sector development process, I don't think that it necessarily, it's only reflected in the, in the value of the land, so the site location aspect of it might be reflected, and it's based on demand. It's not, it, I don't think there's like a performa for the gas, you know, gas price, per, you know, future gas prices or anything like that. I mean, the uh, fluctuations would have to be the situation for the investor to say that. Wait, say that again? I usually, usually these these development projects, if they're transit oriented development, are over several years, and the investors are in it for the long haul, and it's they recognize the risk of doing so. But the the location, the siting of these projects, um, kind of embody that calculation. But I don't think there's something separate. I don't, I've never heard of, but you would know better. I have never heard of an investor pulling out just because of the gas price yeah. fluctuations. Yeah, th there's, huh. th uh, yeah, this might be, you might have actually, I mean, I, I, in terms of uh, um, uh, government criteria for uh, um, uh, 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 grant programs and loans, uh, as well as uh, private sector models for projects, I mean, th there may be, and I hope there isn't, <laughs> a blind spot here in terms of how projected fuel prices would affect uh, demand for whatever facility we're talking about. So. One would hope that you know <laughs> that's integrated into the, the, the to the decision making, but um, uh, at least at the federal level, I'm I'm not sure it is. I know there is at least one person from DOT here. Is anyone remaining from DOT? Are you from DOT? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you're lucky. You'll be working next week. <laughs> Small furlough joke there. Sorry. Uh, so. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't know if the, 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 the new starts criteria, for example, for transit investments include a requirement to take a look at fuel prices as per the annual energy outlook, the latest projection from DOE. I would hope that that would be part of the process, but I'm not sure. So. Okay. Um, there was a question up here, and then uh, you, you, you yeah. ask your question, then we'll come up here to this. Okay. Um, my name is Kunio Kikuchi, and I'm with Washington Research and Analysis. 
My first job in Washington was in 1967, uh, working on the gravity model to, de to uh, determine where is the best optimal place to put the metro line. And uh, then 10 years later, we started the metro. And then I thought the first extension would be to Dallas. And finally, uh, it's uh, being built uh, 40 years, uh, perhaps too late, but uh, better late than never. Uh, my point is, I think I have a great sympathy with the commentator from commenter about uh, Liechtenstein. Uh, having established that uh, oil is an international commodity uh, and seeing that uh, many of the leading countries in the world tax uh, oil consumption, uh, whether it's Japan or UK or Scandinavia, all of Europe, much higher prices uh, than uh, the United States. And, and noticing that those countries now uh, many of them have higher incomes and are more prosperous than the United States and with less income disparity, I think we have to take a harder look at how other uh, countries are managing their transport policies without saying that we are different from other countries. Uh, after all, we are, much as I appreciate Mr. Lova's uh, comment that there should be options for bicycling and so forth, the country is also increasing another 100 million in the next few uh, 20 years, and also they are, many of them are getting older. And the option for running or walking is no longer there. And even driving is getting to be hazardous every time I try to get on the uh, beltway to uh, I-95, I have a uh, uh, existential fear. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I, at, absolutely right, and I think just if we want to look at the revenue side, you know, I, the U.S. Um, pays for about 62 percent of its transportation system, and most other OECD members are at least 100, if not above that, if not several times over 300, you know, percent. So there is something to be said for, um, at least on the revenue side, understanding that we need to um, have that close relationship between pricing and funding the system. In a sense, I feel like we have transferred the cost of transportation to individual families, and because of our development patterns, it tends to fall on the lower middle class. And so we are, you know, the, this connection between prosperity and remodeling this is, is pretty deep. Um, I'm not really sure that people are more receptive to um, remodeling income disparities than they are to a gas tax, however. But uh, definitely in terms of thinking about prosperity down the line, this is, this is a very, very important and, and key thought. Um, you in the front have had your... Did, Real quick, uh, Robert Shredda, international investor. I'd like to bring it back to the taxation issues. It seems states have been far more successful at implementing gas taxes than, than the federal government. Is it because they, they sometimes sneak these through with a legislature that tries to implement them before uh, there's a lot of resistance to, to it? What has the history been? Do you see any trends developing as far as states and their ability? And maybe that would be a more successful route than trying to do it at the federal level, which is going to really mean a lot of politics involved. Uh, I can, I mean, you could probably talk about California. I know, uh, based on, I, I haven't looked at the data uh, uh, in a couple of years, but the last time I looked at it, actually, most states have also had difficulties, largely because of politics, in uh, um, increasing their gas taxes to keep pace with inflation and to keep pace with the cost, uh, you know, of construction, et cetera, and labor, et cetera. There are notable exceptions. Uh, Minnesota, I know, is one of them. Washington stands out as one of them. And the Washington example is one that um, a lot of transportation policy wonks point to specifically because um, they ran a campaign uh, um, uh, to increase the gas tax there. It was a hefty increase. I forget the exact amount. Might have been ten cents a gallon, but anyway, it was it was it was quite a large amount. And the way that they got it done was by providing a list of actual projects that would be built, so that people could see 
the value that they would be getting from the additional investment. And, you know, the governor and the legislature went out and amounted a sustained campaign in favor of, of this increase. And then it was enacted, and now Washington is benefiting from that. Um, and and uh, at the same time, most of the other states have, uh, just like uh, uh, um, uh, the feds, had trouble increasing gas taxes to keep pace with uh, the, the cost of their programs, which is part of the reason that uh, states are lobbying for <laughs> enactment of a uh, federal transportation bill as soon as possible uh, because they're feeling the pinch and they can't do deficit spending, of course, so they're interested in, in a larger federal program to help them make ends meet. So, but there are, you know, for those states that have actually managed to, and actually I don't know if California has done this uh, statewide, but I know that Will Kempton of Orange County, right, um, he passed a, a, a uh, um, a bond measure, uh, or he got a bond measure passed, and it was this, he did it the same way that Washington did it uh, by listing specific projects. So, and highways, transit, you name it, he listed specific projects that would be built. And I just saw the PSA that he's produced to be broadcast in Orange County, and it lists the projects that have been completed and basically says, Thank you. We've delivered. So he's now at the tail end of it talking with his constituents, and there's even a, a part of the PSA where there's an additional project. They saved enough money on the pro construction that they managed to build one or more additional projects, and he's also touting that. And that kind of thing is helpful, and that's, you know, that's where other states could learn from that. And you know, that, that hopefully the federal debate can be informed by that so that we can deal with the big, one of the biggest problems we have, which is that yeah. – polls show that people see this as the, the program that is about Congress's bridges to nowhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, my only argument being, I think you're absolutely right, but uh, because it overcomes this idea that, well, if I send my t federal tax guests gas tax to Washington, they'll somehow, it'll come back to me here in Texas, you know. There's the, where the resistance is, and I think at the state level, you're r quite right. It can be overcome. I, I think it's actually below the state level. Uh, California, despite being on the forefront of many of these issues, uh, has essentially not increased its gas tax uh, for roughly the same period of time that the federal gas tax has stayed uh, relatively flat. Um, in addition to uh, some statewide transportation bonds, uh, the main tax increases that have happened in California to go toward funding transportation uh, have been local sales tax add-ons uh, that are uh, one of the main uh, revenue sources uh, for transportation um, investments. Um, but that's even more localized than the state level. I mean, that's, you know, a tax, sales tax add-on by a county or a couple of neighboring counties in order to fund a regional project. So for larger states, even the state level, um, may encounter the same sort of issue of people perceiving that they're being taxed to pay for investments elsewhere in the state that they might not benefit from. Um, we're coming down to our last question. <coughs> There's a question there in the back. Uh, hi there. Uh, first of all, thanks to the panel for sharing your thoughts and ideas. Um, Matt Sisman with Bloomberg Government. I've actually worked as a transit and transportation planner, sorry, um, uh, in California and also in Texas and other places. Um, here's my question. You, you asked, uh, you talked about transit sort of failing to attract ridership. But in some sense, I see it as misguided. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, about a quarter of trips are work-related. Our TOD is focused on getting choice commuters. The San Ramon example is, is to me, very quaint, but San Ramon, you know, I mean, the people are choosing the mode of transportation. Um, what do we do with a transit system where it cor its use correlates with, um, obviously, auto dependence and low income? And that increasingly seems to be a phenomenon that's happening away from dense regions. So a, a couple of things. I actually want to go back to um, part of the first point you made, and that was about commutes. Um, and I was sort of half expecting you were to go in the direction of what about all those non-commute trips? 
Um, and uh, I think that's, that's worth thinking about. Um, roughly only a little over a quarter of uh, VMT uh, is for commuting. Um, a very low number, uh, given how much attention commuting gets. Uh, and the types of solutions uh, that uh, might reduce VMT for non-commute trips are probably very different than those that reduce VMT for commute trips. Part of that is that non-commute trips uh, are more likely to happen uh, in areas where there's less transit and to remain within a smaller community rather than being metro-wide uh, or cross-metro area trips uh, that commutes are. Um, one reason, though, um, why uh, such a strong focus on commute trips is justified um, is that uh, though it's a relatively small share of VMT, um, they are bunched uh, both in terms of corridors and in terms of time. Uh, and uh, the bulk of congestion problems comes from commuting. Uh, and to the extent that the congestion uh, aggravates emissions, um, that means that the commute VMT, though, again, only a little over a quarter of total VMT, uh, are a particularly important quarter. Um, at the same time, um, the non-commute VMT side uh, is where some of the other uh, strategies around more walkable communities, um, uh, thinking about you know why there's housing uh, near transit, uh, a lot of that uh, has potential to help on the non-commute side. Um, and even those who may not be um, walking or biking uh, as part of a commute trip um, could be doing so uh, for the rest, of, you know, part of the other portion of VMT that goes to uh, socializing, retail, errands, other types of things. Um, but uh, you raise a very important point about you know, why is it that we focus only on commuting uh, or mostly on commuting when we talk about this? Um, there are good reasons to, um, but it's by no means the whole story um, and opens up a wider set of policy suggestions. Other, other responses to that? Because well, then just, I have one. Sure, and, and to be clear, I wasn't saying that transit doesn't attract ridership. I was just saying that <coughs> it really is. Um, and and I, I got the figures that I cited from a, a study that actually compared Germany's experience with transit over the same time period with ours, they've invested a lot less. Uh, they've seen ridership go up substantially, and they've seen fare, fare box recovery go up substantially. And the point of the paper was, let's look at other, at other countries to see what's working, because uh, um, uh, we're you're facing financial constraints, fiscal constraints in this country, and we really need the, the whole program, the whole transportation program, to function more efficiently, and that includes the transit account, uh, uh, which is under some pressure right now, es especially um, in, in, in the House. Um, actually, to go back to the, this question of, of state gas taxes and the way they've, they've sold this to their constituents, uh, there, I think there's a limit, at, at, especially at the national level, to the idea that the way you sell this is by talking about dollar per dollar the return you get for your state, which is that hopefully the part of the purpose of a national program is to promote innovation and to actually uh, move the whole transportation program forward and make it more competitive compared to those in other nations. And the example I'm thinking of, um, interestingly, is from uh, the Bush administration when then Secretary Mary Peters took a lot of unspent money, $350 million or so worth of it, and told New York, if you put in place congestion pricing for the first time ever uh, in this nation, we'll match the money you're able to spend on it with this substantial federal grant. Um, and she took some flack from that. But uh, um, that is the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, there's an argument for that kind of leverage investment to be made in a new practice so that we can advance the state of the practice here in the U.S. and the efficiency of the transportation system through some sort of national leadership. So there is, there is an argument to be made for actually focusing federal investments, not necessarily uh, you know, on uh, low population uh, large states, but on where the majority of the VMT is generated and on where the majority of the congestion is and where the majority of the oil consumption is in order to get innovative practices in place, such as the use of pricing tools that we, we don't use in this country, unlike other countries. So, but. Right. Well, and just I, one thing our leaders are really very much um, s specific about is the federal program needs to support projects of national significance. And I think that it, you know, it 
we're at a point where we can no longer argue how connected we are as a country to the hubs, how the cities are connected. The city metropolitan areas are responsible for 75% of our GDP. Uh, two thirds of our population lives in urban areas. And you know, this goes back to choice and land use decisions and all of that. And it, you know, it, if, if someone in Texas doesn't want to contribute to a federal program to help you know, Chicago work out its transportation system, I mean, they're really failing to recognize how closely aligned freight and travel is across the country. I mean, those are, Chicago is one place where it, it's a major hub. Um, for example, and these are just examples. So I think that there's still a case to be made for a federal program. Um, there, there's a case to be made for the US in relative to the rest of the world that we continue to invest in this way and recognize that there are benefits beyond just what a single user gets out of the system. There's the environmental and social aspects, the economic benefits that we all get from having a functional system. Okay, I, I think we're pretty close to ending. Um, I guess on a final note, I would say that the, the issue of, of um, non-commute time and, and rural area, uh, non-commute driving in rural areas, the whole issue of rural transportation is a really big one. And one I've been thinking about recently, partly because of, of, of doing interviews, and um, we actually have a really uh, very effective rural transportation system, which is the school bus system. And uh, they, they run on time, as anyone who's ever been a rural kid waiting for the school bus <laughs> knows. If you're a minute late, you miss that bus. Um, they run on time. They, are, they move an enormous number of people. I think it's 48 million um, rides. That's two in a row. So 24 million kids a day are taken around on the school bus system. And high gas prices are actually killing that system. Um, because the school systems have not budgeted or not been able to budget for prices like this, and a lot of the school buses get six miles to the gallon. They're very polluting. Um, we do actually need to, to go in there and, and save that system because otherwise you're transferring the cost of those commutes onto the families. Um, and, and really, you know, this, this is actually a transit system that we have that works. We just don't recognize it as that because it's yellow buses. Um, so that's something to think about in the future, and um, we can add that on to the problem of solving the deficit. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. Please come up and talk to us afterwards. <laughs> thank you very much to this thank panel. You. This was a really thank fantastic you. discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa.